Praise the Lord! I'm so thankful that we get another opportunity to worship our wonderful, wonderful Lord and Savior. Let's let's pray. Let's ask God to be with us and to anoint this church service. Oh, Lord, Lord, I am thankful for you. Thankful, Lord, that we have this wonderful privilege, this opportunity, Lord, to, to come before you. Lord, to, to gather in your name. Lord, I pray that you would anoint this church service and minister to each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing a couple of old hymns of worship to God. The first one, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. Wonderful power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another old hymn of praise. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth. Children in his arms, he 
and an honor it is to praise and worship our wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I want to preach to you this morning. The title of my message is Reaching the Unattainable. Reaching the Unattainable. My, my total passage that I'm going to preach from is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, but I want to read verses 18 through 21 as that focus text. John chapter 3, 18 through 21, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Praise the Lord. Reaching the unattainable. Humanity is in a bad place. We have been since Adam and Eve. We have a creator who loves us dearly and has never ever abandoned us, yet we have abandoned him and have shown contempt for him rather than love. We are so ingrained in our determination to please ourselves and to seek our highest comfort that we violently reject any suggestion that it might somehow be best to deprive ourselves of immediate gratification to gain eternal contentment. And the human brain is so brilliant, self-seeking, and manipulative, and manipulative that it devises all kinds of carnal suggestions and temptations to gratify the body and then blames the thoughts on the devil. And we believe it. We believe our own brain and we buy into that deception. The human race is in such a bad place that it is impossible for us to extricate ourselves from the horrible pit that we have dug for ourselves. And still, God has never abandoned us. All that God has ever done in this world from the beginning of creation until right now it has all been for the end of offering you a way to be saved hallelujah god wants you to spend eternity in heaven 
with him. When Jesus met with Nicodemus in this story here in John chapter 3, Jesus met with Nicodemus in the inky blackness of night. And when he did so, he swiftly cut through the traditions and the preconceptions and showed Nicodemus how to reach the unattainable. Jesus showed how the Holy Spirit, the Eternal Son, and the Hallowed Father are all deeply and intrinsically involved in the rebirth of creation. And he also demonstrated that the final choice of believing belongs to you. The scripture that I'm going to be using this morning is my own translation from the Greek Textus Receptus. So let's, let's begin. Verses 1, 2, and 3 is the prologue of this chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This one came to Jesus at night. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one is able to do these miraculous signs that you are doing unless God was with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Surely, surely, I say to you, unless a person is born anew from above, He is not able to participate in the kingdom of God. Nicodemus had all the advantages of religiosity. He was a religious leader. He had the genetics of God's chosen people. And he was a Pharisee, a strict observer of Judaism. Jesus needed to guide Nicodemus from an observer of the miracles to a devoted believer in himself as the Son of God. And that's where God is with you. Moving you, bringing you from an observer of miracles and things around to a devoted believer in Jesus. Oh, I hope if you are not a devoted believer in Jesus, that you will make that choice to be so. It was a real challenge to Nicodemus's position and heritage to think that he had to change something in order to see God's kingdom. Why would Nicodemus need a new birth? He already was of the lineage of Abraham, and and he was part of God's chosen people. Well, here's the facts. No one is fit to be a participator in God's kingdom without some fundamental changes in one's entire person. So, that's the prologue. Point number two... And, and the first point that Jesus makes, he speaks about God, the Holy Spirit. Now, all through this, Jesus goes through the, the, uh, the Trinity. He shows how God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit is all involved in our salvation. So this first point that Jesus makes is about God the Holy Spirit. He gives a new birth. Verses 4 through 8. Nicodemus said to him, How is a person able to be born while he is old? Is he able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Uh, No. Jesus answered, Surely, surely, I say to you, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he is not able to enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I told you it is necessary for you to be born anew from above. The wind blows where it desires. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know from where it comes and to where it is going. So it is for everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now here's something interesting. Verse 8 can also be translated, The Spirit breathes, flows does his spirit thing. There's really no English word. If we translate pneuma, now in uh, the first way that I read it, pneuma translated uh, uh, wind, but if we translate pneuma spirit, then the spirit pneuos. If it's wind, it blows. But if it's spirit, there's no English word for that. He flows, he does his spirit thing where he wishes. You hear his voice, but you cannot perceive from where he comes and to where he is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. A lot of interesting things there uh, where it says, uh, Jesus said, do not be astonished that I told you it is necessary for you to be born anew from above. Uh, Jesus said, surely, surely, I say to you in verse 3, unless a person is born anew from above, he is not able to participate in the kingdom of God. That word that I translated born anew also means from above. Anew or above. And it, Jesus probably was, was speaking this, meaning both things, that you have to be born again anew, but it has to be a birth from above. Uh, verse 8, I mentioned, can be translated two ways, and Jesus probably meant both ways. The wind blows where it desires, or the Spirit breathes. Or does his spirit thing? How? There's not an English word for it where he wishes. It's true both ways. The spirit of God is like a wind that blows and you you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. You can see the effects of it. You can feel it as it comes by. And the Holy Spirit is exactly the same way. You hear his voice. If it's wind, you hear the sound of the wind. But if it is the Spirit, then it's translated voice. You hear his voice, but you can't perceive from where he comes or where he is going. I'm, I'm certain that Jesus intended both meanings to be valid for that. There has to be a natural birth and a birth by the Holy Spirit. Both of them. A natural birth, a birth by water, is just when we're born into the, uh, as a a birth by water, the amniotic uh, fluid uh, often is the, the water breaks before a child is born. A birth by water, a natural birth. But there has to be more than that. I, I'm telling you, if it's just a natural birth, we humans have messed everything up. But that's not the end of the story. There is a spiritual birth also. A fitness for heaven cannot be obtained by one's own personal efforts. No one can be pleasing to God in one's own own fleshly willpower. There has to be more. I hope to get this idea to you that the Holy Spirit wants to renew you, give you a whole new birth. The chemical makeup of your body and the 
incredible brilliance of your brain will absolutely overwhelm any effort to do right. Your hormonal urges will always dominate. Your memories will always remember the wrongs done to you and will want retribution. Your reasonings will always justify yourself and condemn the other person. That's just the way that we are. There has to be a spiritual renewal of a person, and it has to come from above, apart from one's own capabilities. The Holy Spirit desires to have you. Lock, stock, and barrel, all of you. He will continue to convict you of your sin until you yield yourself totally to him. A person born by the Holy Spirit will follow the leading of the Spirit instead of the flesh. And the Holy Spirit goes wherever He desires. I'm telling you, where the Holy Spirit goes, it's different from any expectation that the world has. And I want to be led by the Spirit wherever the Spirit goes. That's where I want to go. That's the Spirit gives a new birth. The second part that Jesus talks about, God the Son. He's the sacrifice for sin. Verses 9 through 15. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Surely, surely, I say to you that we speak that we do know, we testify of what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one can ascend into heaven except him who descended from heaven, namely the Son of Man who is in heaven. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent, the snake, in the wilderness, in the same way it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, so that anyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Verse 15 says, so that anyone who believes in him might not perish. You see, the ultimate choice is you. God's already done everything that needs to be done as we're about to see. It's already completed and everything is up to you. It is sometimes difficult to drop our preconceived notions and follow the Spirit of God. We think we know more than we actually do. We, we can make all of the arguments. We can reason through all of our actions. We can justify ourselves and those who agree with us. But the feeling of peace and the sense of being right will always elude us until we submit to the Spirit. Jesus mentioned that bronze image of a snake. It was a means of healing and salvation to those who looked and believed. In, in Numbers chapter 21, you can read the story. I mean, the children of Israel sinned egregiously, blasphemed God. And they received a punishment for that. Uh, Let's read that. Numbers 21, 6 through 9. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. 
Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. That's an amazing story. Moses made that image of the snake and put it up on a pole. These fiery serpents evidently were aggressive snakes that would chase people down. I absolutely hate snakes. And to the thought of one of of snakes all around chasing me, trying to, to get at me, is a nightmare, but that's apparently where they were. And as soon as that snake would strike them, it was like it erupted in fire right where the snake struck. And that fire would go through one's body until their body was burning with pain. We've sinned. God said, make an image, told Moses, make an image. From that point on, any time a serpent struck, all they had to do was look at the image and believe, and they were instantly healed. Instantly. Jesus said, in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. It's necessary the same way for the Son of Man to be lifted up so that all a person has to do is look at Jesus, believe, and be saved. Jesus has made it so simple for us to be saved that all we have to do is look to Him for His sacrifice on Calvary for our sins and just believe. Hallelujah. The Spirit wants, wants to give us a new birth. Jesus has died on the cross so that all we have to do is look and be saved. But it was the Father who sent His Son into the world. It's mind-boggling to me. God the Father loved His Son. I mean, I'm a dad. I love my children more than words can say. But in a way that's infinitely greater than my ability to love as a dad. God the Father loved His Son. But God also loved the world and sent His beloved Son to die for the sins of those that He had created. Let's read it, verses 16 and 17. For in this way... God loved the world in that he gave his one and only son so that anyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world so that he might pass judgment on the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. It was the plan of God the Father from the beginning of creation for His Son to die to redeem all people. All that the Father does is motivated by His love for people. God sent His Son to be a part of the human race so that He could die. 
And God accepted the sacrifice of his one and only son as the payment of all the sins of humanity. Every sin that's ever been committed has been paid, purchased, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. God sent his son so that every person might be saved rather than be judged. Glory to God. The fourth thing, you are the one who must believe. It's you. Verses 18 through 21. The one who believes in him does not come to trial for judgment. But the one who does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judicial sentence, that the light is come into the world and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Anyone who practices wickedness hates the light, and he does not come to the light so that his deeds might not be reproved. The one who does the truth comes to the light so that his deeds might be shown that they have been performed in God. There is no trial for judgment for those who believe in God for their salvation. Jesus has already taken the judgment on himself. He suffered for our sins on our behalf so that we don't have to suffer any judgment at all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The price for salvation has already been paid. Forgiveness is already freely offered by God, and all that is left is for a person to believe and accept what God has already done. Those who refuse to accept what God has done are logically condemning themselves. God doesn't have to condemn And he won't. Jesus has taken that condemnation. But if a person rebelliously refuses to accept the love that God offers, they condemn themselves. They love darkness rather than the light of the gospel. They want to gratify their flesh and live in their wicked thoughts, and motivations. They refuse to let the light of Jesus shine on them because it will show just how wicked and evil their deeds truly are. The light reveals who a person really and truly is. When a person allows the light of God to shine on them and to honestly reveal who that person actually is, God is able to change them from a carnal, fleshly person to a godly, spiritual person. And then that person is able to genuinely do the right thing in oneself. Not by one's own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit living in that person, born anew, given a power to overcome sin, to overcome the thoughts of one's mind that continually tries to to get a person to gratify oneself and and to do the things that, that, that put the dopamine in the system. In conclusion... The Holy Spirit offers you the opportunity to be born anew. And Jesus the Son has already paid the price for your sins. 
God the Father loves you and wants you to live eternally in heaven with him. So what about it? Will you accept God's offer of love and let him make you anew? All you have to do is just look by faith with those spiritual eyes and believe. Tell God, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry. Lord, I know that I am doing wrong and I don't know how to do what's right. Please forgive me. Please make me a new person. Give me a power from the Spirit that I don't have to make myself do what's right. Lord, I give myself to you. I want to live for you the rest of my life. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you make me your child? I'm telling you, if you will pray that prayer, God will do that for you in a moment's time. You will be amazed at the change that God makes in you. God will change you in such a way that you can reach the unattainable. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Lord, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for you. Oh, the the plan of salvation is such an amazing thing that you have done for us. Thank you, God. The Spirit, the Son, the Father, thank you that you have provided this wonderful plan of salvation. Draw people to you, Lord. Go with each one of us. Give us your touch and your help in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning.